So I'm sure you've seen the video recently of three university presidents, Harvard, MIT, and UPenn, all failing to say that calling for the genocide of Jews violates their code of conduct policies. Take a listen. Does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Penn's rules or code of conduct? If the speech turns into conduct, it can be harassment. Yes, it is a context-dependent decision. Does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Harvard's rules of bullying and harassment, yes or no? It can be, depending on the context. Why is it so hard for university presidents to condemn anti-Semitism point blank? You know, as a student at two different universities here in Toronto, I actually saw and heard a lot of anti-Semitism on campus. And I wondered why it was tolerated. You know, racism and discrimination on campus is very low. In fact, I think it's in the single, low single digits. But when it comes to anti-Semitism and anti-Israelism, many Jewish students report discrimination, harassment, threats of violence. This is all well documented online, and I'll leave links below. There's actually a really good book called The Uncivil University, which I find is a very interesting book collecting the thoughts and experiences of Jewish students across the United States and their experiences in higher learning. So why is it that these three presidents couldn't condemn calling for the genocide of Jews as a violation of their code of conduct? Well, the first reason that I was able to find is, and it's not sexy, but it's the bureaucracy. The bureaucracy of universities have actually exploded over the past few years, and this includes trustees, deans, associate deans, people who have various levels of authority. That old saying, if everybody has levels of authority, nobody has levels of authority, is very much true for these universities and colleges. And so if the university president were to openly say, yes, this is a violation of our code of conduct, and later to find out that because of the bureaucracy, it actually isn't because it needs to go through so many hands before it actually meets a decision that could put the president in a form of conflict. In fact, from 1985 to 2005, the number of professors grew about 50% nationwide, the administrators increased by 85%, and their attendance staff by 240%. And this also is perhaps why so many Jewish students say that they report discrimination, harassment, threats of violence, actual violence to school administrators and nothing gets done, or a slap on the wrist happens. Again, I'll leave links below for this type of testimony from Jewish students. It lends itself directly to the bloated bureaucracies that a lot of these colleges and universities have. Again, everybody has authority, then nobody has authority. So the second reason is the protection of academic freedoms. So academic freedoms allows individuals to pursue all types of thought experiments from an academic lens. But Title VI of the Civil Rights Act in the United States actually says any organization that receives federal funding must ensure that, that the space is protected from discrimination based on race, ethnicity, and place of origin. But a lot of scholars say that part of academic freedoms today include questioning whether or not Israel has the right to exist. Previously, anti-Semitism was wearing swastikas and burning down synagogues and actually creating physical violence towards Jews. But today, many scholars say that the anti-Zionist movement and anti-Israeliism is in fact a form of anti-Semitism. Natan Sharansky once said, one of the major difficulties in grappling with this new anti-Semitism is the ease in which it can be denied. New anti-Semitism, which we have long been dealing with, hides behind the cloak of political criticism of Israel, in which the state of Israel is discriminated against, held to a double standard, and has doubts cast on its right to existence and security. Anti-Semitism even appears under the banner of human rights and humanism, equating Zionism with imperialism, comparing Zionism with Nazism, and doubting the right of the Jewish people, unlike other peoples, to a nation state, cannot be considered political criticism or opposition to the occupation. So academic freedoms are being protected so students can question the right of Israel to exist and critique that. But scholars say that this in fact is anti-Semitism because it is questioning an entire group's right to existence. And third, Across all universities and campuses, there's this anti-globalization, anti-imperialism, anti-American sentiment that I've experienced that I'm sure thousands of other students have experienced as well. You know, Israel was created by imperial powers. It was created in land that was previously occupied by the Palestinians. And so that right there lends itself to the idea that this is a creation 
of the West. And because it's a creation of the West, it's open to more criticism and critiquing. As well, there are many student organizations on campuses that are very well organized in openly discussing the crimes committed by Israel. But many of these movements criticize the acts of the Israeli government, while also bridging it to say that all Jews support the Israeli government. Student organizations are very well organized and very active, and a lot of academics choose to not get involved because it's a very complex issue and it aligns with anti-imperialism, anti-globalization, and they want to carve out that space for students to explore these different thought experiments, but at the same time not acknowledging the real potential threat that Jewish students face on campus. So what can be done for moving forward? You know, Unlike any other group, race, ethnicity, or culture on campus in North America, no other group faces levels of discrimination and harassment the way the Jewish community does. Stronger punishments are actually necessary for any type of anti-Semitism happening on campus. Much like other groups where we see spikes in violence against specific groups, given that reality, I think universities should actually draft codes of conduct that specifically call out anti-Semitism for what it is. And harsher penalties should be for students who engage in any type of anti-Semitism or anti-Israelism calling for the destruction of the Jewish people or somehow not detaching itself from the actions of the Israeli government and the Jewish people as a whole. I think that's a very important piece that universities need to build into their code of conduct, that you have every right to criticize any government, but you cannot, you cannot then leap to say this one government represents this entire people. That's not right because that foments and fosters an environment that is discriminatory and very harassing to Jewish students and people in general. Second, I think university presidents, Harvard, MIT, UPenn, and others, need to come out forcefully saying that they're making these changes and they're going to make sure that these are done immediately and expediently. This received national and international headlines. So I think when we see the research for what it is and we see the types of discrimination and harassment that Jewish students face, I think it's incumbent upon universities and colleges to update their codes of conduct specifically to include language about anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism, and making sure there's a distinction between critiquing the Israeli government and its actions and the Jewish people. What do you think? Let me know in the comment section below, and let me know what you think about the university presidents and their testimony to Congress.